All right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Spokane Dream Center Sunday School. My name is Josh Maltzberger. It is a blessing, an honor, a privilege to be here again with you this morning and to be opening up God's Word, hearing from Him, and we just want to pray and kind of get, get back into the Word here. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, thank you for shining the light into our lives, into the darkness of our lives, Lord God, the sinfulness, the wretchedness, Lord, the waywardness, the rebellion. Though we were yet sinners, Lord God, you died for us, Lord. You came on a rescue mission, Lord, to reveal the saving knowledge of God that would be accomplished through Jesus Christ on our behalf, Lord. You've brought this knowledge to us. Even 2,000 years after the cross, Lord, the light is still going into the world, Lord and changing it for the better, drawing people into salvation, delivering people from the clutches of the enemy, Lord. And I, too, was once in that darkness, Lord, and I saw the light, Lord God. I give you praise and glory and honor for all of eternity, Lord, for saving me, for what it cost you to purchase my life, to reconcile me to God, Lord. And I thank you for this body and this people. Lord, I pray this morning, Father, as we look out at a world that is just gleaming with uh, the sun shining, Lord. We spiritually give you great praise, Lord, for the light that you've shown into our hearts, and we want to learn what it means, Lord God, to be the light that you have said that we are, and to carry that responsibility to be the light to the world, Lord. Help us, Holy Spirit, this morning. Bless us with your presence and your instruction, Lord. Guide us into truth, Lord, as you promised you would do. And we give you the praise and the glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we've been here. We're in, we're in Matthew uh, chapter 5. We're, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. We've been through the Beatitudes. Last week we talked about uh, verse 13. You know, you are the salt of the earth. And then here we are in verse 14. Jesus says that you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your moral excellence, and your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds, and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, now remember the context of where we are in this sermon, and who it is that's speaking, of course, Jesus. Who's listening? These are the early followers who have they've been they've witnessed Jesus doing some miracles and things of that nature. And so there's a lot of people being drawn to him. He goes up onto the mount and he's going to give this message, give this sermon. And so there are really a lot of remember what a lot of these men and women are fishermen, carpenters, builders, everyday lay people that have heard of this, you know, this Messiah, this, this Jesus, this character, this person who's on the scene, and they're coming to hear from him. So, one thing that I didn't know, but as I was studying this out, is that, so for the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, there's the Jewish, you know, elite, uh, like in their rank, that their, their highest rabbis, some of them would be regarded as that's what they would call them, the light of the world, you know, Rabbi so-and-so or Rabbi so-and-so. So because they had this, you know, perceived great intellect understanding of God, of his law, and would be able to give that to the people around them. So that's a descriptive term that had been used before, but in reference to Pharisees, in, re in reference to, to Jewish leaders, to rabbis. So when Jesus comes on the scene... And he's got fishermen and, you know, the downtrodden, the downcast, the hurt, the lonely, the seeking, all of these people, you know, and they're coming up to him and he's telling them of his kingdom and what the, the kingdom characteristics look like for a follower of Christ, for a follower of God, somebody who's been introduced into the kingdom. And then he turns around and he says, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. That's an astounding thing. That's, a, that's an astounding thing. Everybody there probably 
if, if they had any understanding of that context, would be like, what do you mean? I, I'm the light of the world? Me? I'm, I didn't sit under, you know, whoever Paul sat under. You know, I didn't, I didn't sit under, you know, who, this, this rabbi. I, didn't, I haven't been, you know, given to all of this religious understanding or learning or anything like that. What do you mean, I'm the light of the world? But Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world. Not just, and really, and think about it. So easy to just, oh, I know that scripture. He says, you're the light of the world. Here they are, sitting on this mountain in Israel, right? They're in, they're in a, a centralized location. Not just, you're the light of your house, or your city, or this nation. You are the light of the world. You are what's going to carry the illumination of the kingdom to the whole world. You are the light of the world. Now that is an astounding thing to prophesy and to, to proclaim, to speak out. And yet here we are, and I want, you to have, I want you and I to have a great appreciation for the reality of the church, its existence alone today. That the church is still going out as imperfect as we are. As many as are falling away and, and backsliding and denominations are splitting and all that is true. But the church is still going out and feeding the hungry, and clothing those that are homeless, and giving money and, and all sorts of different things to charitable organizations, taking care of people, and still preaching the gospel, and we are still seeing, seeing lives turn around. I'm looking directly out here at, you know, two dozen people that the church is still saying, come in, let us minister to you, let us love on you, let us serve you, let us bless you, let us teach you of Christ. So that you can enter into the kingdom and you can have all of eternity with God. And so even in the here and now, God wants to turn, turn your life around, change your heart, illuminate, reveal himself to you, and help you to walk in truth, in righteousness, in victory. And lives are changing. I'm not the same person I was over a decade ago. Completely different by the grace and glory of God and by Christians, believers who cared enough to open up a place for me to sacrifice of their finances to, to create an opportunity for me to have a place where I didn't have to work, didn't have to deal with this, didn't have to do that. I could heal. I could get be restored. I could get trained. I could get built up. I'm telling you, the church is still doing it. And it's not just the Spokane Dream Center. The church around the world just like you are the light of the world, it is still happening, it is still going, and it will continue to go until he comes back. Because that's what he declared, and that's what we are committed to doing. So it's who you are. You are the light of the world. That's an identity statement, right? That's, he doesn't say, go be the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. So it's really, if you are in Christ, you need to take that, hold that. That's an identity statement. Now, Jesus is also, is the light, right? We're going to get into some scriptures that talk about that. But, but you are the light of the world. That is your identity, and it's also your responsibility. So you are blessed to have the light of Christ in you, to reflect the light of God in your life, in your life and you are, in that sense, the light. It's not your internal light because of, it's not because of Josh's light, it's because I have the Holy Spirit in me, it's because I reflect the glory of God, so it, it's his light in me and reflecting off of me that the, that the world sees, so you are the light, because you're carrying his light. And that's also my responsibility and your responsibility, to take that light into the world. You know, if we're to go into the world and make disciples of all the nations, that's part of our call and our responsibility. He didn't save us, give us his light so that we can hide his light in our homes and go, I'm a Christian here, but then I go out into the world and I just kind of just try to make it through that. No, we're to carry our light into the world as well. So, it's peculiar that you and I are the light of the world, that those early followers would be called the light of the world. Not kings, not dignitaries, not the elites, not those who had wisdom. You know, Plato and Socrates, they're dead. Not, no, no other philosopher, uh, but everyday people like you and I, followers of Jesus Christ, carrying and reflecting his light. You are the light of the world. 
that's a tremendous responsibility. You know, you could, people could be searching for the light. People could be, you know, searching for wisdom, searching for knowledge, searching for understanding. And it's easy to direct them to many different places. But ultimately, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. I want to introduce you to the Savior, to the Redeemer, to the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Let's go quickly to John chapter 8. In verse 12, once more Jesus addressed the crowd. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not be walking in the dark, but will have the light, which is life. Let's go also to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4 and verse 2. We'll start at 1. For behold, the day comes that shall burn like an oven, and all the proud and arrogant, yes, and all that do wickedly and are lawless, shall be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you who revere and worshipfully fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings and his beams, and you shall go forth and gamble like calves, released from the stall, and leap for joy. And then it carries on. Now that looks forward to a future time for the nation of Israel. But they're, when their Redeemer, when their Jesus comes back, of course. But Jesus Christ, when he in his earthly ministry, he said, I am the light of the world. And then even in our future, when Christ comes back, because he is the light, that's what's being described there. He's... He's still the light of the world, and he's still the coming light for the Jewish nation. So, his light is to shine through us. Um, sometimes, and I'm going to use two examples, you know, throughout this this morning in, in some of the things that I talk about. <clears throat> the, the first one is maybe a little, let's start with the more dramatic one. Okay. Because this is often how we look at the world, especially if we've been following Christ for a while. And in today's day and age, where the darkness seems to be getting darker and the light is getting lighter, right? We hear that all the time. So anybody ever had to go underneath a house, go into a crawl space? Okay. Yeah. Couple, couple times. You know that kind of like that thought, that, that feeling that comes inside when you know there's a busted pipe underneath there. Like, you know, there's, I don't know, feels like a heating duct might have fallen off or something and I got to go underneath the crawler. There's a certain measure of, you know, what's underneath the crawler? I, oh yeah, it's dark under there, right? We just, we just kind of let, we kind of let what's going on under there just kind of deal with itself. There's a reason we don't like, you know, have tea parties in our crawl space, right? Like that's, it's just, there's stuff going on in there. But if you got to go, but you have to go in for the good of the house. You got to go in, right? Something's got to be done about this. So you going to, I mean, are you going to go? <laughs> it might be easier to kind of close your eyes and be like, I don't see, I don't want to, I only want to carry a little bit of light. Like I want the, I want the 100 lumen, not the 750,000 lumen light. That's not the one I want. I want the like 150 lumen so I can see about this far away from me, make it to what I got to fix. Okay, let's fix this. Now we're turning back. As soon as we are done, we're getting out of there. Okay. Let's now let's get out. Of, let's get out of this crawl space. Why? Well, why do I only want to carry a little light in there? Because. <laughs> Because I don't want to see the spider that's a two and a half feet past there that's about this big, you know, or the dead rat that's out of the corner because, like, I've been underneath crawlers a lot, more than I would like, unfortunately. <laughs> so I've seen stuff, right? But it's, it's, <laughs> I've been scared and banged my head up against the, you know, the, the flooring, the flooring joists. Okay, we're getting sidetracked. I'm, I'm experiencing all these crawl. I'm reliving all these <laughs> crawler experiences in my life. It's just fairly traumatic. <laughs> but it. But my point is that if you think about that, 
that underneath that crawler is sometimes how we view the world. We look at that world and the world system, and we're like, it's so dark out there. And yeah, I know I got it. I know I'm kind of cold to go into it. I know I have to. You're the salt. You know, you said you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. You're, I'm supposed to go in there, right? And it's easy to, be, to have a little fear, a little trepidation, to know that there's going to be some stuff in there that's ugly, but it is still my call to carry the light, to get in there and do what needs to be done. Okay? And I need to be less afraid of carrying a bright light into there, despite what it might reveal. And that's what I, how I want to end my message, but we're not there yet. So we'll end, we'll end when we end. <laughs> the, the other example would, that I would have that's maybe a little bit actually more practical and maybe less thought of is when we're the light of the world, you think about it when you wake up like a day like today, right? You wake up, you throw on a couple lights, really nothing too bright. Right, and you just kind of, you're like, man, okay, I'm awake, I'm good, you, and you start to feel like after you know 15, 20 minutes, all right, I'm in the light, all is well, right. I'm cruising through the house, everything is good. But then you open that front door, and the light's straight on you, and you're like, whoa, man, so much brighter out here, right? Sometimes we think we're in the light, <laughs> but we're only allowing so much light to be in our lives. And God wants us to open up the door full swing and allow all of his light to come in and out of us in the world around us. So, sometimes we just aren't aware of, being, of, of us actually being in the darkness. And so much of the world, you know, sometimes we can, again, in those two examples, you can think about the world like, well, they're just, they're in that black underneath of the you know house it you know gutter and they kind of like it there man so it's just it's and there's truth there's some truth to that i've you know i've been there but like but not everybody's like that not everybody's in that much darkness some people are walking around and they just don't really know that they're in the darkness they're like i'm kind of in the light actually it's good you know i got buddha i got muhammad i got this i got that i've got socrates i've got plato i've got i've got you know some light but they haven't experienced the true light of God, Jesus Christ. They still need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not actually in the light. They're deceived. Remember, the enemy is an angel of light. But he's not the true light. He's not Christ. And so there's so much of the world where the true light needs to go into the world and to illuminate and to bring truth, the truth, the revelation of God's character, his word, his redemption, everything that's accomplished through his future, everything that's accomplished through Christ. His kingdom needs to come to people. And the lies that the enemy has deceived and oppressed people with need to be completely broken in Jesus' name. You are the light of the world. Let's go to John chapter 3. We're all familiar with John chapter 3. We're getting familiar with it. Certainly John 3.16. I know my daughter could come up here probably and repeat John 3.16. I won't put her on the spot though. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. He who believes in him, who clings to, trusts in, relies on him, is not judged. He who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. For him there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no damnation. But he who does not believe, cleave to, rely on, trust in him, is judged already. He has already been convicted and has already received his sentence because he has not believed in and trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Christ's name. 
the basis of the judgment, the indictment, the test by which men are judged, the ground for the sentence lies in this, and pay attention, the light has come into the world, and people have loved the darkness rather than and more than the light. For their works, their deeds were evil. So, that is an extremely sad and sobering truth. In the one aspect, we have John 3.16, maybe the most life-giving, glorious truth that we receive, of course. And it's the message that we still carry to every individual around us. And yet also the reality of our experience tells us that Jesus' words are true. That there are those that while the light will go into the world, just like Jesus came into the world, remember they crucified him. Even though the, the light came into the world, it will be received by, I'm going to say few, and rejected by many. Because they love their deeds, they love their evil deeds, they love the darkness more than the light. So, <clears throat> just because we're called to shine the light, a sobering aspect of that is to remember that it may or may not be received. doesn't matter, we're still called to shine the light. We're still called to shine the light. And to follow our perfect example, Jesus, who is the light, who never stopped shining his light to the world around him, even though ultimately it cost him his life, which he wanted to do anyway. So it worked out in his favor and, of course, in our favor. Man was made by God for God. If we refuse this, we are wrong and will continue to stumble in the darkness. And very sad to have family members, loved ones, co-workers that you know of, that you've witnessed to, that you know the truth has, you know, they've had an opportunity to receive the truth, to hear the truth, and yet they reject, they still love their sin, they still love what they're doing, they don't want to repent, they don't want to receive, they don't want to walk in righteousness, they choose the other path, heartbreaking, breaks God's heart even more than ours. The world lies in darkness. I, I got a lot of these notes right here from a, a part of a sermon from Chuck Smith, so I want to give him credit because this is not all for me, but he talked about the dark ages, that this time period after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, uh, due to a, sup supposedly due to a uh, decline in culture and in science. We came out of this, you know, roughly 250, 300 years ago and began to experience the age of enlightenment, a new age where science could take the place of our savior. This was supposed to be a golden era for mankind as scientific knowledge would increase and produce beneficial things. But science seems to have become a golden calf that we have fallen in line to worship. Looking back to the last century, the 20th century, up to today, can we consider this a true golden age? We had two world wars, the Holocaust, right? We've had tremendous, the dropping of the atom bomb, I mean, we've had, so, let's continue. Science has brought us, <clears throat> it was this a true golden age? Remember, remember one thing that we've heard from the pulpit from Pastor Dave, what are, what are the two biggest issues with the church right now? Convenience, comfort have become idols in the church. Science has brought us many conveniences, right? How we travel, the ability to hop in a car and go miles and miles and miles here or there, or an airplane and be here on this side of the country and then move over to this side of the country. You can have breakfast here, dinner there, right? What, wow, that's, that's incredible, right? <clears throat> We're not in horses and buggies anymore. I mean, this is all in the last 100, 200, you know, 150 years or so. Airplanes, global interconnectivity, the internet. We've got appliances at home that are supposed to save us time, like dishwashers, washing machines, vacuums, and yet, do we really have any more time to enjoy our lives? I can tell you, in my family, no. <laughs> no. Seems like we're always going, always moving, always seeking for an opportunity to rest, but it's hard to find, even despite all of the advancements in technology. We've got security systems for our homes and 
all sorts of different weapons to defend ourselves. We've got heated blankets instead of the old school style, right, for comfort. We've got, but are we really sleeping any more secure? We have science to thank for farming changes across, you know, our nation and across the world. They've given us fast, convenient food at nearly every street corner. But we end up spending more money to buy vitamins and things that aren't in the food, right? So thank you, science. We worship you, you know. We have, even just in our phones and our computers, immense, vast, nearly inexhaustible measures of knowledge to just immerse ourselves in, to keep us informed. But do we really know what's going on in the world around us? We think we do sometimes. And because of time, I'm not going to go there, but I'll just give a brief summary. Part of this, too, I want you to understand and have an expectation that, you know, that whatever it looks like, even from our pulpit, we are getting closer to the end times if we're not in them. One of the indicators, if you read chap, uh, chapter 12 of Daniel and verse 4 specifically, but read the whole chapter, because <clears throat> God gives Daniel a lot of you know information about the end times and what it's going to look like, but it talks about knowledge, going, you know, people going to and fro and knowledge increasing. And it's twofold, it's twofold. <clears throat> So I don't want you to only see the negative or, or anything like that. But think about just in the natural, like we're talking about. I, you know, anybody still have an encyclopedia at their home? No, right? Because it's on my phone, right? And there's more than that. There's probably a dozen encyclopedias. There's a dozen commentaries. There's a dozen this. I mean, you got everything at, the, at your fingertips on your phone. Knowledge, which you had to go to the library for and go through the Dewey Decimal System and find that, like all that stuff, boom, it's right there. See how much more convenient that is? I can read three books in the time it would have taken me to go check out that book. And, you know, So your ability to increase in knowledge overall, just in general, in the world, continues to increase. And it's rampant. It's, it's hyper-elevated and continuing right now. And yet, the other end of it, and yet we, we're not always ending off better off. I'm not saying that there aren't some benefits to science, you know, and, and all of those things. There are. I'm not, uh, science in itself is not evil. It's what we do with the science, right? I'm thankful for contact lenses. I would be begging on the streets if I didn't have contact lenses, okay? So, you know, I'm not so anti-science that I'm going to, you know, not, I'm going to walk to work because that vehicle is just demonic. I'm not going <laughs> to, like, that's, that is not going to happen, right? Okay? But what I'm talking about is a spiritual indicator of where we're at in the world and in the course of redemption history, which would say, Jesus, that the God pointed to Daniel that this is, this is what's going to be evident at that time. So that is happening. Also, it's, it's also speaking of the word of God increasing. You know, it was just a few hundred years ago that the printing press came out, Right. And people actually got to have this for themselves. There was hundreds of years, you know, <clears throat> over a thousand years where people didn't have this for themselves to read. It was, but God preserved it. That's a miracle in itself. But God preserved it. God declared it. God still made it get out to the people, you know. But we, yeah, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So there was a lot of people just hearing it, not reading it. But it took faithful people to actually transcribe everything down for hundreds and a thousand years, right? To get everything this way, it's so, to preserve the integrity of the whole. And God did it, supernaturally through people. That's incredible. But, since the advent of the printing press, and then since, and since the 1800s into the 1900s of different coalitions, people that went, I, you know, really missionary efforts that said, I want to take this word which we have and get it to the nations, and print as many Bibles, and get it passed out, and like, there's all these stats, I don't have time to go through all the stats, millions and millions and millions of Bibles, the Bible is by far head and tails above the, the best-selling, most printed book ever in the history of the world. It's not even allowed on the top ten list. They won't, they won't allow it on the top, top, top ten list. You know why? Because it'll always win, every time. It's the Word of God. It's incredible. And it's available to everybody. 
nearly. There's still people in different areas where it's hard, it's restricted, it's confined, it's against the law, there's all those things. And yet, collectively, globally, we see a time when that word and that truth is accessible. And again, like I said, on your phone, even if you don't have, even if you don't have ten physical, on average, the average Christian, according to this survey, has nine Bibles at their home. Nine. I went, yeah, I guess I'm an average Christian. Something, something like that, right? But I've got more on my phone. I've got, I got, I got a whole list of them on my phone, and I got commentaries on my phone. I've got all of this stuff right at my. So what, what's that a sign of? We've got this knowledge of God, the Word of God, increasing and growing forward. And so what's God doing? He's He's bringing the world to a place where it's without excuse. That's what's happening. So when we say the darkness is getting darker, but the light is getting lighter, it's because God is allowing and creating a separation between the two. He's making his, and that's, he's called us. You are the light of the world. You're a part of that. It's one thing to have the word of God accessible. It's another thing to be a living epistle also going out into the world. That's why I still believe for a worldwide revival where there's so many people full of God, full of the Holy Spirit, actually walking it out actually loving, actually serving, actually sacrificing their lives for those, inviting people into the kingdom. There's so much of it going on that those who would reject that light, both the printed word, the electronic word, and the living word inside of you and me, if you continue to reject that forever, eventually Jesus is coming back to judge. That's what's happening. So maybe I got a little sidetracked. But I don't think so. I think it's right in line with the message here. You are the light of the world. Not science. Though we uh, we appreciate science. Good science. All right. We've got psychiatrists who can analyze and classify disorders, but ultimately they make you dependent upon drugs to cope with life. We could talk about military advancements and what they've done to help the world and then sometimes to ruin the world. Crime is rampant. Laws are contrary. Uh, We have laws that are contrary to God's wisdom and to common sense. Jails are overcrowded. Families are in disarray. Divorces are at an all-time high. Many just not getting married at all. Millions of babies are being sacrificed at the altar of Molech because of the worship of Ashtoreth. It's a reality. Sobering. That's like the crawl space. That's the crawl space of the world. That's the reality of it. But we are not called to go and live away from the crawl space forever (laughs) in a vacuum of light. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to go into the world. Amen. Amen. 1 John 5.19 says, We know positively that we are of God, and the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. Worldly wisdom doesn't bring to man the knowledge of God. In contrast, it actually tries to deny the existence of God. Sure. Just, and you're familiar, just every, if you need a reality check, a sobering reality of where we're at, and, you know, read Romans chapter 1. But don't be discouraged personally. Let it drive you to a place of compassion and care <laughs> and a desire to do that which Christ has commanded us to do, to be salt, to be light, where we are, where where he positions us. Now, think about Paul's calling in Acts 26, 17 and 18. it, It says, choosing you, Jesus, talking to Paul, choosing you out, selecting you for myself, and delivering you from among this Jewish people and the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may thus receive forgiveness and release from their sins and a place and portion among those who are consecrated and purified by faith in me. That same calling that Christ gave to Paul, while his is a specific calling, you can just hear the general calling of Jesus for all of us in that. For all of us. It's his desire that none should perish. Light exposes. It reveals what is hidden in the darkness. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5.
I know we already studied Ephesians, but it's always good to go back. And it's connected. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, he says, Take no part in and have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness. But instead, let your lives be so in contrast as to expose and reprove and convict them. For it is a shame even to speak of or mention the things that such people practice in secret. But when anything is exposed and reproved by the light, it is made visible and clear. And where everything is visible and clear, there is light. Hallelujah. We, the light of the world, according to Jesus, expose the darkness going on around us. So sinful, sin-loving people don't feel real comfortable around you. Have anybody experienced that? You go out, you go to your workplace, you go to, you know, a family gathering, with family you don't gather with all the time, a bunch of non-believers, and all of a sudden, like the conversations, you can stay in a conversation for so long, but eventually that conversation, as cordial as it may be, they're going to start getting out of line in the things that they're talking about, right? And you're going to have to put it, be put in a place where you go, you know, I'm not really comfortable, I need another glass of water, you know, what, whatever it may be, right? Or have you ever had somebody just, I had it just happen to me at, at work the other day. I was out there in the yard and one of the guys, he's describing something and, just, and there's, boop, this... Uh, curse word comes out and immediately he says oh i'm sorry and he moved on right it's because that word doesn't come out of my mouth right it doesn't come out so he recognizes that and goes all of a sudden he's like oh you know i'm uncomfortable right now because i feel like i did something why that's the light of christ that's what that is it's not me it's just the light of christ that's what we're called to do and, not, and hopefully not just, see, it convicts and exposes and it reproves what is wrong, but hopefully you're also caring, like, it, you know, I also didn't follow that up with, like, oh, yeah, that was wrong, and I'm here to judge, and you know what, you better go sit in the corner for 30 minutes because of that curse word that came out of your mouth, right? No, that's not what I did. I said, oh, Thanks. You know, and I carried on the conversation and I just continued to love him. And hopefully that warmth and that light that you're carrying not only reproves their sin, but draws them to want to have a deeper relationship with you, which ultimately you can drive them to a deeper relationship with Christ and have an opportunity to talk about Christ. Remember Psalm 119, 105, the word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Light keeps you from stumbling. In Proverbs 4.19, it says, The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Let your light help them get on the right path. That's what I wrote down. Because so often it's easy to be like, I got my word, I got my lamp, I got my light, I know where I'm going, and the rest of the world, they better figure it out. Because I know, you know, I know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says they're in darkness. They don't even know what over, over what they're stumbling. They don't know how to get on the path. They can't get on the path themselves. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit, and guess who the Holy Spirit works through? People, you, me. You, care, you are the light of the world. You carry God's person inside of you. You carry his light, his illumination, his truth, his love, and you're on a path that leads to glory. And as you walk that path, if there's those that are stumbling along the way, let the, don't be afraid of showing them the light. It might just be what brings them into that path. Don't settle for, I'm on the path, and I, you, you got to stick. You don't, you don't get off the path to help somebody else in that sense. But you have the light. You can guide somebody into the path. So, John 8, verses 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In him, John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And John 1, 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In the Amplified, it says the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out or absorbed it, or appropriated it, 
and is up, unreceptive to it. I thought about this. This is such a huge topic, and i got one, probably 30 seconds left, but I'm going to go a little bit over. <clears throat> Think of the darkness that covered the land for three hours when Jesus was hanging on that cross, right? But then, light. See, the darkness couldn't overpower the light. I mean, it was a sign. It was a wonder. Yes, what was going on. It was, a, it was supernatural. It was a miracle. Shouldn't have been able to have just a natural eclipse. You know, all, the, all of those themes are true. But ultimately, I even thought about it this morning, and I was like, you know, three hours, you know, to me, three hours and then light. And I just thought about it. I was like, you know what? Uh, I know this isn't scriptural. This is just me. But I was like, three days, and then he's getting up. Now, I see a connection. I'm not saying there is one for me. I think God is just going, this is happening, man. It's all in line with what God was doing. So, John 9, 5. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We must be both, <coughs> we must be both uh, light receivers and life givers. See, Jesus said that when he was in the world, he's the light of the world. But we have received his light. And now, see, remember Jesus, when he talked with Paul, when Paul was persecuting Jesus, when he's persecuting the church, Jesus says, you're persecuting me. See, you and I are supposed to be so unified with Jesus that we aren't Jesus, but we are his ambassadors, his representatives. In that sense, Jesus is still on the earth because we're his followers. We're his body. That's what he said. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So that's why he can say, you are the light of the world. Because it's him. It's his light. In you and me. We're his body. Jesus was not calling and had no intention of calling closet Christians. He calls us to live for him according to his way and his power in the world around us. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You've experienced, you know it, uh, if you've ever driven to a large city. I know for me now, if I drive over, to, I don't consider Spokane all that large. So I, if I drive over to Seattle and I, the minute I see those buildings and all the traffic and all the things going on, I can feel my heart rate guys, you know, go up just a little bit. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be in this wretched city. But I'm going to a baseball game, so it's going to be fun. But that's, the, you know, that's about the only reason I'll go to that city. But there's something, maybe in a, in a better time, when you would look at a city and you'd go, wow, I just can't take my eyes off that thing. I'm drawn to it. It's, it's, a, it's a spectacle. It's, it's something amazing that you would cast your eyes on. In, in, in fact, even as some commentators talk about where Jesus was at, there was a, there was a city, I've got the name, but I'm not going to find it right now. There's a city of like one of the largest cities that was on a hill. He may have even been pointing up to this city that was, that was right there for them to look at with a physical example of what they were to be like. City set on a hill can't be hidden, right? You're not a closet Christian. You can see it from a distance. You're intrigued, and you want to know what's going on there. That's how our lives should be. That's how our lives should look. Uh, Matthew Poole said, It is as much as if our Savior should have said, You have need be holy, for your conversation cannot be hid, any more than a city can that is built on a hill, which is obvious to every eye. All men's eyes will be upon you. Safet is the name of the city. I found it in my notes. Um, I know some of us don't like being in the limelight, don't like being in the spotlight. That's a normal thing. I don't desire to come up and have you know, 30, 40 sets of eyes on me and give a message. That's not something I internally desire um, personally, but it is something that I'm willing to do as a Christian, as a follower, to do, to do the call of God. I'm not ashamed of my faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I know what I'm called to do. I'm called to be salt, called to be light, just like each and every one of you. And there's a time coming as the separation of the darkness and light you might have been able to get away with kind of being a closet Christian before. It's becoming less and less, you know, uh, available for you to do that because the people are sticking their heels in the ground where they stand. And if you're a Christian, I'm just telling you, it, there's going to be more eyes on you. And that's okay. It's okay because that's actually what God called you to be and to do. So don't be afraid. Be encouraged because you're fulfilling the call of God in your life. It gives light, you know, I apologize. Very quickly, I want to finish this. 
he talks about not hiding your, your not hiding your light under a bushel, under a basket, but placing it on a lampstand. So there's an intention. Putting something on a lampstand, a light on a lampstand, speaks of intentionality. What you're actually supposed to have a heart t- bent towards is not for your own proclamation, but for the proclamation and the and the furthering of the gospel. I want his message to be as high, as lofty, reaching as much of my sphere of influence as I can. So I actually want to position his light in somewhere on the lampstand where it's most visible so that he gets the glory, right? And so that's, that's you're to place your light on a lampstand. And then so it says so that all in the, you know, it gives light to all in the house. That's a twofold um, picture. There's a practical in the natural, I should be salt and I should be light in my own physical home with my own physical family. If I can't do it there, but I'm trying to do it out in the world, I'm missing the mark. I'm missing something, right? That's, that's, that's the practical everyday example. Or if you're not in your own home with your family, you're in a discipleship with a bunch of people, guess what? All in the house, I'm called to be light to you, right? And that's the natural practical application. The, beer, the bigger spiritual picture uh, Charles Spurgeon was quoting the Venerable Beatty, which, man, that's an interesting name. Christ Jesus brought the light of, <coughs> um, sorry, Christ Jesus brought the light of deity into the poor lantern of our humanity and then set it upon the candlestick of his church that the whole house of the world might be lit up thereby. And so indeed it is. And we're going to end with that. I've got a few more notes, but for those of you who love to study the Bible and are interested in themes like, like, oh, where was the first mention of this and stuff like that? That's the first mention of Father in the New Testament is in correlation with us being the light of the world, being his ambassadors, his children, doing his good works that he would be glorified as the Father of the church in heaven. Something deep, something amazing about that. I've gone way too far over. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time. We bless you, we honor you, and we pray, Lord God, in the coming week and under our time to come, Lord, that you would continue to teach us, instruct us, and enable us, Lord God, to fulfill your calling to be salt, to be light to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.